так сложилось, и не только у нас в России, что от прежних сражений до 20 века в национальной памяти сохранились единицы воинских имен. Княжеские дружинники были безымянны, московские стрельцы, петровские солдаты, суворовские гренадеры, гусары, уланы войны 1812 года, все они были почти безымянны. Мы запомнили их общий подвиг, но история не донесла до нас их имен. Мы запомнили имена князей, полководцев, атаманов, куда реже офицеров, и саулов, рядовых же за тысячелетнюю русскую историю и горсть не наберется. 20 век можно с полным правом назвать век пришествия народа в историю. Маршал Жуков, Зоя Космедемьянская, маршал Рокоссовский, Александр Матросов, маршал Конев, Зина Портнова соседствуют в национальной памяти. Может быть, в эпоху атеизма наши павшие, наши Войны, наши мученики заменили нам святых. И с тех пор мы смотрим на их лица, как на лица святых. The most striking and terrible thing about the war is that it pulled the youngest generations into the maelstrom. Some might claim that never before in Russian history had children fought, but they would be wrong. Among the Cossacks in the 16th and 17th centuries, boys set out on campaigns from the age of 14 and expanded Moscow's borders. During World War I, 15-year-old Ivan Kazakov set out on a number of successful scouting expeditions. He stole a German machine gun on his own, and he saved the life of his superior officer. Kazakov was awarded three crosses of St. George. 16-year-old scout Vasily Ustinov cut through the enemy's barbed wire fences and, together with three of his comrades, eliminated a German patrol consisting of 12 men. It has everywhere, at all times, been the case that the terrible burden of war fell on those who were barely out of childhood. Alexander Matrosov lived to the age of only 19. He was a rifleman in the 2nd Battalion of the 91st Siberian Volunteer Brigade named after Stalin. He never knew his parents, and he was brought up in an orphanage. But when the war broke out, 17-year-old Alexander, like thousands of his peers, wrote a letter to the authorities asking to be sent to the front. Matrosov enlisted in the army in September 1942 and reached that front. On February 27, 1943, his battalion attacked the Nazis and came under heavy fire. Matrosov, together with his fellow soldiers, crawled to the enemy bunker and silenced the Nazis' machine gun with grenades. The Soviet soldiers, including comrade Matrosov, then went on the offensive, but again the machine gun began to fire. Matrosov stood up and used his own body to block the window of the bunker. These few seconds during the battle decided everything, for while the Germans in the bunker were deprived of their view from the window, the Soviet offensive went on. Matrosov was posthumously awarded the distinction Hero of the Soviet Union. His display of heroism was then repeated in a number of other divisions and under other circumstances. In total, some 100 men use their own bodies to block firing positions. Just imagine that number of people, though not all of them are remembered today. Matrosov is celebrated the most of all. Perhaps in this case, everything just fell together neatly. A boy from an orphanage, a young fighter, and an attack on the Nazis that proved a success. These things certainly seemed so important because yesterday there was just an ordinary young man just like hundreds of thousands of other soldiers. But today, he has become a legend, a hero for the nation. 
The people began celebrating, not only fearsome warriors clad in their armor, but also tender young soldiers, like one's own son or brother. More than 3,500 frontline soldiers under the age of 16 officially served in the Red Army. They were referred to as the sons of the regiment, though there were daughters as well. However, this figure does not include all those children who were members of underground resistance movements. In occupied Belarus, over 74,000 boys and girls battled the enemy. Comparable figures were found in Ukraine. Youngsters in Kursk, Belgorod, and other regions became partisans. The total number of children serving was at least 150,000. Центральные детские эвакуационных приехали два боевых друга, самые молодые бойцы одного из партизанских отрядов Белоруссии, Миша и Саша. Миша, а ты расскажи мне, что вы делали в партизанском отряде? Мы из партизанского отряда уходили в город Борисов, в разведку, прослеивали листовки, производили диверсионные работы. В последнее время мы троем, Витя, Саша и я, who were these children? They were mainly children left without families, whose parents had been killed or disappeared. What could the leader of a partisan unit do with them? Just drive them away? Sometimes they were evacuated to Moscow at the first opportunity, but often they were allowed to serve. Red Army commanders often took their own children to the front for all kinds of reasons. They had no one to leave them with, and ultimately, the kids were safer at the front lines. Often, war served as a school of hard knocks. A photograph has survived of a young boy adding his name to the wall of the Reichstag. This is 15-year-old Vladimir Tarnovsky, who joined the army in 1943, when Soviet forces were liberating his hometown of Slavyansk. Vladimir enlisted in order to avenge his slain parents and his younger brother, whom the Germans had captured in the Donbass. The first time the boy distinguished himself was when he guided lost trucks carrying fuel and provisions to the front lines. He was up for a commendation, but then a political officer decided it wasn't good to award mere orderlies, and he advised that the boy be transferred instead to intelligence. At the age of 14, Vladimir Tarnovsky became a scout. The teenager won his first medal for saving a wounded officer during a crossing of the Dnieper River. His next medal came for bringing back an enemy soldier. On a scouting mission alone, he captured a German that was almost twice his size. Who better than Vladimir Tarnovsky to put his name down on the wall of the Reichstag? Arkady Kamanyan was the son of the Soviet military pilot and decorated hero of the Soviet Union, Nikolai Kamanyan. For young Arkady, the military was a family tradition. In February 1943, his father was made commander of an air assault division on the Kalinin front. His wife and son joined him at this new place of assignment. 14-year-old Arkady immediately began working as a plane mechanic and then started to fly himself. In July 1943, General Kamanyan personally authorized his son to fly. The young man immediately showed a natural fearlessness. During one of his flights, he saw a damaged Eel II lying on a neutral strip of land, and he immediately rushed to aid it. He brought the wounded Soviet officer and his camera equipment aboard his own U-2, and then he returned to base. For this act, he was awarded the Order of the Red Star. In early 1945, Arkady Kamanyan delivered secret documents to a band of resistance fighters. He flew over the front lines using an uncharted route in the highlands. In just two years in the army, 
the young man won six medals, though he died in 1947, after the war, from meningitis. So it sometimes happens. In the Navy, too, there were young men serving. Often they were sons of sailors who had perished in fighting. Valery Lyalin enlisted in the Navy in spring 1943. By this time, his father, a commander, had been killed in fighting, and his mother had been killed in the bombing while she was working in a factory. Valery was wandering around the port in Batumi when he ran into Lieutenant Andrei Cherensov, captain of a torpedo boat. He asked Cherensov to take him aboard. Cherensov himself had grown up without parents, and he took pity on the boy. Thus, some had pity on children during the war and allowed them to serve, and these children were truly thankful. Either there was such pity for children in these years, or such remarkable children. Valery Lyalin performed his greatest feat in September 1943. As their boat was delivering a landing party, it came under brutally heavy fire. As they were already coming up to the landing, the fuel line of one of the engines was hit by shell fragments. While brave young Lyalin was repairing one of the engines, the other engine stalled. Most of the crew perished, their commander was severely wounded, and those who still survived expected the end to come soon. Everyone aboard the boat were sitting ducks and awaited their doom. But in spite of the heavy fire, Lyalin was able to restart the second engine, and he stood himself at the boat's helm. After the landing party was set down, the boat headed back. To steer the boat, Lyalin had to stand on top of a box. Otherwise, he wouldn't have seen anything. Marat Kazier served in a partisan detachment named after the 25th anniversary of the October Revolution, and then as a scout for the 200th Rokossovsky Partisan Brigade. Kazier was born in 1929 in a village near Minsk. By the outbreak of the war, he had finished fourth grade in a village school. Before the war, his father had been arrested and charged with wrecking and Trotskyism. It's important to note that after this, Marat Kazier's mother did not decide to welcome the Nazis. No, this wife to a man branded an enemy of the people hid a resistance fighter in her own home, and she was killed for this. Marat and Ariadna, children of a so-called enemy of the people, joined the resistance. Marat went repeatedly on scouting missions and helped to destroy trains. During fighting in January 1943, he led his comrades in an attack, though wounded himself, and they were able to escape encirclement. For this, Kazier was awarded the Courage Medal. In May 1944, when Marat Kazier and his commander were returning from a mission, they encountered the Germans near the village of Horomitskia in the Minsk region. The commander was slain right away, but Marat kept firing back as long as he had bullets. Out of ammunition, he waited until the Germans came closer and blew himself up with a grenade. Marat Kazier was posthumously awarded Hero of the USSR. We, молодое поколение, клянемся, что по примеру своих старших братьев комсомольцев готовы отдать в нужную минуту все свои силы, а если понадобится, то и жизнь. The youngest hero of the USSR was Valentin Kotik. He was born in 1930, and when the war came, he had finished fifth grade. In a village occupied by German troops, the boy secretly stockpiled weapons and ammunition for the resistance. In fall of 1942, Valentin was given his first real mission, to take out the head of the local German police. Amazingly, a group of boys, the eldest of whom was just 13, threw grenades at a passing German convoy. Their target, German Lieutenant Franz Koenig, was killed, along with seven other German soldiers, and some 30 men were wounded. 
On October 29, 1943, Valentin Kotik was the first to notice that the Germans were coming for his detachment. With his first shot, he killed a German officer and raised the alarm. On February 16, 1944, just five days after his 14th birthday, Valentin Kotik was wounded in the battle for Izyaslav, and he died the next day. Zina Partnova was a member of the underground organization Young Avengers, and she served as a scout for the Voroshilov Partisan Detachment in Belarus. Partnova was born in 1926 in Leningrad. After seventh grade, she went to spend her summer vacation with relatives in Belarus, and it was there that the war caught her. Starting from August 1943, Zina was fighting in a partisan detachment. In December 1943, she was assigned to identify why the Young Avengers organization had failed and to establish communication with the underground. After Zina returned to her detachment, she was arrested. During interrogation, the girl grabbed the Nazi interrogator's pistol from the table, shot him and two other soldiers, and tried to escape, but she was caught. She was tortured for weeks, after which her hair, incredibly, had turned white. On January 10th, 1944, 17-year-old Zina was shot. In 1958, Zina Partnova was posthumously awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. One of the most revered figures among Russians is Zoya Kosmodemyanskaya. She was a partisan and part of a sabotage and intelligence unit on the Western Front. She became the first woman in World War II to be awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. In October 1941, she arrived at a recruiting station as a volunteer, and after she was briefly trained in sabotage, she was sent to Volokolamsk. She was sent out on a series of missions where she laid mines on roads and destroyed enemy communications. Her next assignment was to burn down the following settlements which the Germans had occupied. Anashkina, Petrishova, Ilyatina, Pushkina, Bugailova, Gribtsova, Usatova, Grachova, Mihailovskaya, Karovina. After she had destroyed these places, her mission would be deemed accomplished. This was a harsh measure for command to resort to, but what else could they do? The Germans were outside Moscow. Soviet command quickly realized that the cold winter would at least demoralize the German soldiers and sap entire Nazi units of their ability to act effectively. The destruction of these settlements, among other things, sparked chaos among the German troops. As Zoya was carrying out her mission in the village of Petrishova, she managed to set fire to a hayloft, and she was about to burn down a house where four German officers and an interpreter were quartered. She was spotted by the owner of the house, alas, a Russian, and handed over to the Germans. The owner of the house was rewarded with just a bottle of vodka. Under interrogation, she was lashed over 200 times. She asked for water, but instead of water, they brought her an open kerosene lamp. When Kozma Demyanska's body was exhumed, it was found that her fingernails had been torn off. Yet, she never gave up any secrets. As Zoya went to her death, she managed to shout with incredible composure, Comrades, victory is with us. German soldiers, surrender before it is too late. According to another version of events, her last words were different and more fearsome. There are 200 million of us. You can't hang us all. 
Just wait. Stalin will come. Zoya immediately entered the pantheon of popular martyrs. Poems were written and songs composed in tribute to her. People saw in her their own daughter or even a saint. Also of the same general age as Zoya and Alexander Matrosov was Maxim Passar, born in 1923. In 1941, the 18-year-old set off for the front as a volunteer. In the Nanai language, Passar means sharp eye. Hunting and fishing were in his blood, and he dreamed of going to sniper school. He was sent there for training in 1942. After training, he served in the infantry in the 21st Army. In September 1942, he was appointed commander of a sniper unit. By October 1942, Passar had become the best sniper on the Stalingrad front and eighth best sniper in the whole Red Army. The Germans were exasperated by Maxim Passar and put a price of 100,000 marks on his head. Funny enough, they dropped leaflets personally appealing to him to surrender. On January 22, 1943, as Soviet soldiers made an offensive near the village of Pishanka, they were hindered by two German machine guns. The commander sent Passar to fix this. After reaching a point 100 meters from the Germans' positions, the sniper took out both machine guns, but then he died from mortar fire. For a sniper, death always loomed. But by this time, his tally of Nazis killed stood at 234. Here, we cannot forget one more hero of the USSR, Dmitry Ofcharenko. He was the son of a rural carpenter. He had completed fifth grade in a village school, and in 1941, he went off to war. His gunner company fought in Moldova, near Baltsy. Private Ocharenko was hauling ammunition with a cart when he came up against a German detachment consisting of two trucks and 50 soldiers led by their officers. One of the German officers got out of his vehicle and knocked the Soviet soldier's rifle from his hands. What did Private Ocharenko do? Just put his hands up? No. Private Ocharenko simply grabbed an ax off his cart, like the carpenter's son he was and killed the German officer with it. This demoralized the other Germans, who only stared in horror at this crazy Russian. Ofcherenko did not waste any time, however, and he started hurling one grenade after another into the crowd of Germans. In just minutes, 21 of the 50 German soldiers had been killed. The rest had fled in panic, including the second, now wounded, German officer. Once Ofcherenko was out of grenades, he again took up his ax, caught up with the wounded German officer, and decapitated him. Dmitry Ofcherenko was awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union with its Gold Star and the Order of Lenin. In the fighting to liberate Hungary, Private Ofcherenko was severely wounded, and he died from his wounds in January 1945. You probably know of someone else who was the son of a carpenter. One always has to be careful with such men. They have the power to change the course of history. <laughs> 